Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the first Horasis US conference. Um, today on this panel, uh, which I'm chairing, my name is Vandana Harris, I am the Um, given the passing of the recent nearly $2 trillion um, stimulus package um, by the Biden administration. Um, on the panel today, I have the honor um, to introduce you five distinguished panelists. Um, and in no, no particular order, I will introduce them briefly and then let them say a little bit about themselves um, as we proceed. Um, first, we have um, David Drake, he is the founder of um, LT, LDJ Capital, sorry, I got that wrong, um, and um, with a focus on family offices, um, and they have a global uh, footprint around the goal of um, optimization of wealth. Um, next is um, the treasurer, Zach Conine, he's the Nevada State Treasurer. Um, currently acting, appointed in 2019, I believe. And he also, he has a background in hospitality and gaming with a passion for helping small and medium-sized businesses. We also have uh, John Graham. He's the founder of Global Ideation with expertise in cybersecurity, intellectual property strategy and um, valuation and crypto and blockchain. Again, extremely hot topics. Um, in the current economic market. Um, we have Tuan Gwen, he's the CEO of Boston Global Forum, a nonprofit founded to bring together uh, thought leaders from across the world. And finally, but not least, we have Jason Grumet, who is the founder pre and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, again, a nonprofit think tank, which is actively promoting bipartisan solutions um, to Amer Amer some of America's most difficult uh, policy considerations. Um, welcome, gentlemen, to this, policy, uh, to this panel, and um, it's a real pleasure. Um, I wanted to start, um, and of course, you know, as you speak, please introduce a little bit more, and it's particularly if I've missed it, <laughs> a really important fact around what you do. Um, but I, given sort of the recent passing of the stimulus, um, I really wanted to start there, um, one, given the size of it, but also the focus around um, child poverty. I didn't grow up, as you can probably tell by my accent, in uh, the United States. And I have to say, it seems like an oxymoron that we talk about the United States of America and child poverty in one sentence. So um, I wanted to start with you, Jason, if you don't mind, sure. around what you, you believe um, this this stimulus package will do for sort of America and the new America as we come into a new administration, and in particular what it lacks um, in terms of policy and where you see sort of your, the, the Bipartisan Policy Center helping um, in sort of maneuvering the policies around maybe the stimulus, but also enhancing the policies that are probably the forefront of this administration. Thanks, Mandana. I have to say it's um, delightful to be involved in a discussion which is presumptively extraordinary. Um, I think that does match the times. I think if you wanted us just to say 30 seconds about kind of institutional perspective, um, the premise of uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center is to basically combine the, you know, the rigor of a think tank with the intensity of a lobbying organization. And we have about 100 or so staff work on a lot of the major <coughs> national issues and just about, you know, our government at the moment, um, we basically have a government of largely good people with incredibly bad incentives. And so what we do as an organization is to try to improve those incentives. And the good news is you don't have to do that much to actually enable our elected officials to actually try to govern in the national interest. And so that's kind of the premise of the organization. And we try to provide kind of political you know, enforcement, real policy development, and then um, you know, real advocacy to draw them into a consideration of national issues. Um, the question about what is missing from $1.9 trillion stimulus package is a somewhat exotic question, um, recognizing the $23 trillion debt that my children are going to be responsible for. I think I will just 
open the conversation with a framing that we have to do two things. We have to deal with the abject misery and deprivation facing so many people in this country because of this pandemic and create a course for new economic dynamism. And those are different things. You know, this stimulus package actually does a little bit of both. It asserts that it's emergency aid and about a trillion of the $1.9 trillion truly is. And then it begins to build towards recovery. As you know, one of the most significant uh, changes in national policy is creating a kind of monthly child support credit, which will be up to $3,600 for a young child and $3,000 a year for an older child. And that's a fundamentally new idea for the country. It's a one-year provision. And so one of the key questions for the Congress going forwards is which of these ideas that were established based on the premise of emergency now become lasting public policy? The challenge going forward is to shift to investment. We have to figure out how to modernize our infrastructure. We have to figure out how to create a public health system that can you know, be resilient against these kinds of challenges going forwards. And you know, fundamentally, we have to think about how to transition from this health crisis where we're trying to keep people apart to an economy where we have to bring people back together. So I think that's the next package of legislation. And I think that gives a great segue to sort of um, to uh, Treasurer Conine, where, you know, you have sort of the weight of your state and, and its constituents on your shoulders. And as you sort of unlock this trillion or this um, this stimulus package um, and some of what Jason has said about, you know, the child credit just being for one year, yet there are people who are desperate um, for help, but also as a as a state and as a country, you have to kickstart an economy that, fr frankly, has been asleep for a year during this pandemic. Um, sort of, what are your thoughts on it? And really, how do you do that? <laughs> well, that that has been the question of the last year, I suppose. Uh, I will make two brief uh, corrections to the intro, just for the sake of everybody. One. Uh, I'm elected, not appointed. I only mention that because my wife and I had to knock on a lot of doors uh, and she's an earshot. I don't want her to think I forgot about it. Uh, number two, um, you know, it, it, Nevada, right? So everybody just kind of like in, incorporate Nevada into your life. Um, it's how we know that you care. Uh, but when it comes to the money that we're getting in from the stimulus, it, it's not just the state and local aid. But let's talk about just the state and local aid for, for a brief moment. Nevada is going to receive about $4.1 billion at the state and local government levels. To scope that, our annual budget is about $4.2 billion, right? So once you take out Medicaid and the other pastors, mm -hmm. it's a big, big, big chunk of money. And I think from a state level, our perspective is how do we make sure that we deal with those initial uh, responses, right? How do we make sure we're getting shots in arms? How do we make sure that people are getting back to work, that our unemployment system and various other systems that frankly all over the country uh, have proven to be, you know, inept when it comes to the actual challenge in front of us? How do we rebuild those systems? But then how do we actually train people uh, and expand on? You know, it was one year ago yesterday when the governor shut down the Las Vegas Strip and the gaming industry in Nevada. That was a massive shock to our system, uh, put a lot of people on the unemployment rolls, and we've been working since then to try and make sure we're in a better place. We mentioned the child tax credit. That's really going to help here in Nevada, right? We've got more than 40% of students in our largest county are on free and reduced lunch, which means they're under uh, a level of poverty that you know should be concerning. Um, and we're hopeful that that credit as well as other things that are in this bill and other things we're going to be able to enact at the state level and help to move that. You know, it's a generationally uh, changing amount of money. And frankly, let's hope that we don't have this kind of money flowing into states in the future because it almost always comes with a lot of people dying, right? And so since this is going to happen, since it has happened, I think a lot of the responsibility falls on state and local leaders to make sure that the money is executed properly, right? Because Congress sets up uh, the bill, right? And the bill has some really broad guidance in it. The Treasury Secretary and the, the good folks at the Fed Treasury are going to put out rules about how that money can be used. But it's going to come down to state and local budget officers, to treasurers around the country, to governors around the country, to figure out how exactly that money gets on the street and to make sure that it goes for things that can actually solve long-term problems as opposed to some sort of short-term or political political need. And I think Jason hit it right, right? I mean, government is full of uh, well-meaning individuals who are poorly incentivized. And I think this is an excellent, I hope I paraphrased it correctly, Jason, um, but I think this is an excellent time um, 
to see who's got the chops uh, and who is going to take uh, the efforts to make sure that that money is spent effectively. Right. And I think one key factor, obviously, child poverty is something we don't want to see. The other key factor is the e the economy, right? And and the importance to kickstart an economy, um, probably in a way that definitely in our lifetime we have not seen um, happen at, on a global level. Um, so over to you, Tuan, and I know you do a lot of work internationally. I think it is particularly in, in Taiwan and uh, mainland China. And I'd, I'd love your thoughts on, one, the stimulus package, which is, of course, domestic first, and it has to be, as has so many countries taken the position, you know, obviously you've got to make policies that work for your domestic market and the people first. What effect do you see in terms of this administration's need for policies across the globe, but also in terms of China, which is, you know, a topic of conversation um, as we move from the last administration in a very different manner to this administration. Yes, I think a very exciting topic and interesting issue that is uh, how to deal and work with China now. I think that China's growth and uh, price is uh, very good for the world, but we need to uh, manage and uh, together to how to make the world peace, security and better that is the problem. And I think the very good for us that is that we need to ally with alliance uh, to make norm standards for every country needs respect and work with and apply with news and new and norms and standards. As uh, we are uh, last year, uh, we are uh, Boston Global Forum and uh, World Leadership Alliance Club of Mari and we uh, collaborate to announce a uh, social contract for DIH. That means norm standards for the world in AI. It's how to work together, uh, include uh, government, uh, civil society, corporation, and uh, people. So to build the new world and better, <laughs> that means very important for us. And I think that is a key and fundamental for work with China. China needs to respect the normal standard global because uh, we are support and help China very much for China grow so far in technology, in finance, in investment, and China very different 40 years ago. So that's good for the world, but need to China from now need to respect the world, need to respect the West standards and resolution for that it make the mutual benefit and make the world better. China should not move, that not, uh, not, not, cannot explain by China way to, oh, China need different standards, different culture, something like that. You can see Taiwan, you can see Japan, you can see South Korea, and also can see Vietnam, the same political system with China, but Vietnam different, open, and respect with the world, Western and the West normal standards. So I think that is very important for the West and the Importance really um, of technology, cyber from cybersecurity to just you know what what happens in the future in terms of both protecting um, the United States, um, but also enhancing um, the offerings of the United States across the globe and as, as a global leader in economies. Um, John, over to you. In terms of, I know we've spoken before and you have some really interesting ideas as to how how do we make that leap and how do we use technology in a way um, to enhance not only policies, but make them maybe fairer in terms of the, the scope that they have um, and the sort of the socioeconomic balance that they have going forward. Okay, well... Um
intellectual property in the U.S. And um, it, its estimate was somewhere around about a trillion dollars a year. Um, some would also say that's that's somewhat low. Um, and it, on a broader level, when you look at, um, I, I feel obviously that intellectual property is is a very much neglected part of the conversation on economic development. And um, it certainly has the potential to be a very significant, significant contributor to economic development. Um, for one thing, look at the economic discontinuity. When you look at intellectual assets, they account for mm, somewhere around about a little bit over 80 percent of organizational value, roughly you know, 60 trillion dollars or so. But when you look at the actual trade in intellectual assets, it accounts for less than 1% of global trade, about a mere $365 billion a year. So obviously there's an enormous economic discontinuity in the fact that this asset class accounts for the bulk of organizational value, but only a, a minuscule portion of global trade. And that's what we've tried to address, obviously. And um, we, we don't need to go into all the details, but... And we already mentioned that we're losing about a trillion in, in IP theft every year. Um, another major loss is the fact that people are not able to market their technology um, when it's still secret. This is uh, one of the biggest challenges of intellectual property and how you manage it and how you protect it, but how you market it at the same time. And we're addressing that with a, a free service where you can actually register intellectual property and through a a recently developed kind of encryption called fully homomorphic encryption. You can keep these documents encrypted. We can't read them. The only person who could read it is the original contributor. Um, but people can search for keywords. And if they find a, a match on keywords, we give them a mechanism where they can approach the owner of that IP and request access, attaching a one-click, two-click NDA at the same time if they wish. So the idea is to try and um, bring forward the, um, the economic benefit of new ideas by making it much easier and for people to access them and for them to be able to access them much earlier and to build this community um, that, that's doing this. So th that, th that's a short point on how I think um, the the intellectual property aspect of economic development is very important and it does have major challenges that's why you have the economic discontinuity but i believe all of those challenges can be addressed and result in in significant economic benefit um, for every country and thank you john and a lot of this has to do with obviously partnerships between the public and the private sector um and in terms of sort of moving forward but also an understanding um from both the asset class but also from the leakage um that you currently describe that goes into tri trillions of dollars um and on that sort of um david in terms of sort of the family office area and then of course your experience both in the blockchain and cybersecurity as um crypto area, but also sort of hearing from the private side um, and I would call it the money side. Um, love to hear your thoughts on how you think sort of from a from a stimulus package to sort of kickstarting the economy where the wealth where, you know, this pandemic is shown to make the richer richer. Um, where does that fall in and what obligations do they have in terms of what happens in both policy, but also the collaboration between private and public sectors. Well, thank you for the question, Madonna. And uh, and continuing on the uh, answer that John gave us, I think you know the policies of the U.S. are going to be very closely watched, specifically in the cryptocurrency space. Meanwhile, you know China has their coin, a uh, uh, national coin that they're pushing out. And uh, the SEC in FinCEN has been very strict on how to handle the fraud and the uh, madness that we saw from crypto during 2017 and 18 from the ICO world. The new generation of these, uh, also known as DeFi, it's technically in the simple format, it's a savings account. You get a high percentage by holding your coins in a wallet. 
And obviously, like all gener- Generation X, we want to have a cool, fun name. So we call it DeFi. We call it stacking. We call it liquidity pools. But it all comes into very creative solutions on how, how to deal with finance and blockchain allow that to do so. And the U.S. has taken, obviously, a very positive stance by going after the fraudulent f- firms around the world. And their long arm has extended around the world to, to accomplish that. I mean, there must have been over 10,000 letters in 2018 that went out to companies around the globe to let them know that we're watching what you're doing and you can't. And if you do take money from U.S. citizens, we are here to protect them. Uh, right now, we were worried. I think the industry was worried about the new administration and what their outlook would be. With Gary Gensler being the chairman of the SEC, I think they have settled down to look at it positively. He ran the CFTC in Chicago. He understands commodities. And he also was a teacher at MIT prior, teaching on blockchain specifically. I don't personally think that he will drastically change the rules. And certainly not, you know, halt ongoing investigations and practices that's in place. But I think he will be able to streamline a better vision for how it could be handled properly. And the policy development, you know, and, and that essence for the U.S. is that that is a positive change. We have a positive view over how blockchain can be used and whether it is a security or not. If it is a security, it falls under the dominion of the SEC and FinCEN. Now, I think on what John was saying about IP, we do have a new uh, erupted uh, er, uh, new industry in NFTs. NFTs are digital collectibles. They're called non-fungible tokens. Now, of course, you know the crypto industry wants to have complicated words for everything, but it, they are digital assets that can actually be identifiable and backed up by IP. And I think what we're going to see now is going to be a little tumultuous how you see in the news that, you know, LeBron James dunking in a video was sold for $230,000. Elon Musk girlfriend sold a video for $6 million over the weekend. Really large numbers for collectibles. And the, on the flip side, the policy is going to have to come in and say, well, which ones are actually backed by the copyright and which are not? And I think we have a little of a mess right now over the next year. A lot of infringement of copyright will occur, and it will become a mess. You know, for instance, Disney's going to have to lawyer, lawyer up and go after everybody globally who's infringing on their IP. And in the policy aspect of this, it's going to be very interesting to see what's happening. FINRA, and a couple letters came out just recently where they're saying, well, it depends. It's a security, falls under our domain, if it uh, 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 adheres to the how we act, and this is security versus not. So I'm looking at the, the policies from that aspect, but also normalcy with my family office businesses abroad. We have offices in Ukraine, in Kiev, in Dubai, in Hong Kong. And I'd like to see the policies develop that we can start doing business with China with Russia coming back to a normalcy that we didn't have before. And that's really what I'm watching at for business for myself. And coming back to your question about family offices, I think if the national businesses are going to be able to expand depending on the policies of the U.S. So over to you, Vandana. Thanks for the question. Yeah. So I really love to hear from you, Zach. And, and in terms of, you know, as the, the state treasurer, what, what are your first thoughts when we talk about um, crypto and we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the dumping of all these, but um, also in terms of how that plays into the states, either from a taxation perspective, you know, um, from the element of Vegas in a different form. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, a couple of things. I think from a, uh, I'll take the last one first, from a Vegas in a different form, um, I would argue that, you know, at least in Vegas, you know exactly what the rules are uh, because it's all very highly regulated. And I think as we move that way, and, and that's not a knock, they're just different types of things, right? In Vegas, you're going to come and get a couple of cards and something's going to happen and it's a mathematical uh, probability. We know exactly what the outcomes could be. I think in the world of crypto, there's a, a higher range of probabilities and that is exciting for some people. Uh, it's less exciting from a government investment perspective, right? So I would say government is generally 
really risk adverse, right? The downside of early adoption often outweighs potential upside, at least, and this gets back to Jason's point, on how we're all, um, how we're all incented, right? I manage a $30 billion portfolio. Uh, I don't make a single cent if we make more money in that portfolio, uh, but I lose my job if we lose money in that portfolio, right? And the rest of us get voted out of office. And so that, that incentive is a little bit different. I think when we look at adoption, that Congress is generally not made up of tech forward people, right? And so they have to be brought there slowly and say, this is okay. And then here's another uh, way that we can use it. And this is okay and see how this is safe. Um, and, and we move there probably more slowly than we should uh, as a country or, or as a state. Um, but I think that's historically how we've gotten there, right? Progress doesn't get made as, as quickly as perhaps it should. With that said, I think it's important that we set up um, tax scheme is that, that treat assets like assets, treat speculation like speculation. And we try to work with the industry to make sure that those uh, schemas are fair and consistent. I mean, I think that's the other concern that you're going to see is that different states are treating these assets mm -hmm. in different ways, whether it's what happens to them when they become unclaimed, what happens to them from a tax perspective when they transfer between parties, right? Is it is it an asset or is it a currency? Um, and, and that has big, big implications, I expect, for the long term and also a fair amount of uh, implementations from a economic development standpoint, right? I mean, these companies who are creating these assets, companies who are managing these assets are going to want to locate where uh, the government at least understands them um, or is uh, inclined not to hurt them, right? right. And uh, in Nevada specifically, we've put out a couple of rules over the last couple of years, a couple of laws about... to allow local governments to be able to keep records on the blockchain, right? So now in Washoe County, which is where Reno is, in case anyone would like to visit, it's beautiful stuff here. Uh, in Washoe County, they keep uh, marriage records on the blockchain, right? right? But that was a big deal. It's not, I know on this conversation, that's not a big deal. That's like the world's easiest use case. Uh, but but in, in Nevada, it was a big deal. Um, and that's bringing companies in to do it. We might have just added another agenda item on Jason's already full plate for bipartisan policy and adding <laughs> the importance of IP and, and the technology in, in sort of the future. Um, moving on, and I think we could have an entire hour really on this conversation, and it's, it's super interesting, even for me from a peripheral perspective, um, you know, and a legal perspective actually around the safety of blockchain, et cetera. But we, moving on to sort of the policies of this administration and really given that probably for the last year um, from a global perspective but also from a domestic perspective not much in terms of policy happened um, so what Jason love to hear sort of what what are you talking about um, what are the sort of three hot topics that uh, people care about on a bipartisan level and is this administration focusing on that or would you like it to focus on things that it's not currently focusing on? Well, so look, I think the, the last 10 minutes do really reveal the reality of the two economies that our government is dealing with, right? We have some people who are spending literally millions of dollars on a TikTok video and others who are making $7.25 an hour, right? So you know, our government has to find a way to engage both those fundamentally different realities. You know, I think in terms of the, the key policy agenda, you know, we are still in pandemic recovery, right? The, the you know, CDC, our you know, top health folks are still basically telling people to keep apart. And there's an inflection point, hopefully very soon, when the argument is going to be, let's get back together and let's animate that, you know, with not just a tremendous amount of money, but structures to spend that money, right? So, you know, there is a lot of money pulsing through the system, you know, as was um, suggested, we're not used to this, right? We don't really have mechanisms in place to make sure these resources are being used well. It really does rely on public servants at the state and local level to make those choices. So, you know, in terms of going forward, 
Infrastructure, 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 right? This is the best idea that never happens. It's one to the after action report from, you know, the Obama presidency, the Trump presidency, everyone said what they should have done first was infrastructure. Because this is one idea that has the, you know, the kind of general history and genetics of being a collaborative exercise. So, you know, that is where the Congress is now going to be focused. Anybody who wants anything now is calling it infrastructure. So the first question is, you know, what is the scope of this legislation? Is it going to be the traditional highways and water infrastructure? You know, we think we're going to need to add broadband. You know, one of the things that this pandemic has um, revealed is that broadband is not a, uh, you know, opportunity for watching videos. It is a fundamental necessity for being part of the 21st century. And so I think there'll be a big focus on broadband and then energy and climate policy which is a you know, key focus for the world and the Biden administration. But there's a reality check right now, which is coming out of a global pandemic is generally not a great time to grow the economy with big new taxes or major regulatory structures. So I think you know, our instinct is that you are going to see this infrastructure metaphor basically try to provide kind of the foundation for decarbonization. And there's quite a bit of bipartisan support around innovation. There's generally a lot of support about having the government spend money rather than consumers and citizens. And so, you know, we think it's really going to be kind of an infrastructure lane that's going to dominate the debate. And then we're going to have big conversations about immigration and higher education and a lot of other issues, which I think, had there not been a pandemic, would have been on the first two-year agenda. I think because of the pandemic, they're probably on the third and fourth year agenda of a Biden administration. So three words you use, all eyes, right? Impact, innovation, um, and infrastructure. That, that's the focus. So taking it then, uh, obviously America being such a key player in the world, the global economy, where I'm assuming the focus is also going to be around, uh, to, to, a, to a broader extent, um, infrastructure, innovation, um, and impact, as we talk about sort of just the discrepancies that have happened um, throughout this pandemic. Um, Tuan, over, sort of, where do you see this policy affecting, um, or the policies of the U.S. affecting the Asian market, for example? Um, in particular, as sort of conversations start around what, what the what the policy will look like um, in terms of this administration's interactions with with China, but also the global interactions uh, with China and then the Asian countries on a border. Yeah, I think the first that is uh, for inside the US uh, suit us three things. The first that is uh, faster, we do faster, where we, many things we do slow. Uh, as uh, I and uh, Larry Summer <coughs> chat at uh, dinner, he took a bridge from Harvard to the uh, uh, Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School only repair for three years. Too long. That is that many things. We, but the second, we need to do smarter because we have AI now, AI edge. So we apply AI solution, AI technology, and digital to make more that is the, that smarter treatment politics, society, and economy and business. The third, that is the more in fact, uh, effective as uh, Elon Musk do very low cost for many projects so we can do three things for uh, inside the US, buy it inside uh, three things <coughs> ASEAN market. ASEAN market is a very big market but uh, we think uh, we need to have policy to ask China open market because um, equality for companies and business sector from the US and China. Why? We support for China. China can come everywhere in here for 40 years to develop China mainland. So why we, we don't have equality of opportunities for business sector in the US and Western country in China? So I think that is a very tough and very uh, consistency to ask China government have to open. Why we open for any companies from ASEAN, China, came here, open companies and develop and use the market and uh, 
exploit the market here, but companies from the US cannot come to China to do that open and Google, Facebook, and uh, YouTube, and many companies very, very tough and very difficult in China. Why with very inequality? That is the, this policy have to do very much for that. And also that is uh, we have to protect uh, IP because uh, very important. Uh, we, we we very very much lose in that is technology and IP from the US to market, and that is a big problem. We have to show now not only tax. Uh, President Donald Trump very much do tax, but I think now more we should do more. Very this is a high for the US and China very honest and directly to talk. China get benefit a long time for 40 years from the US already. So why China don't respect and don't, uh, that is uh, uh, meet with our demand. So that means this is the time very important to do with China. And I hope if we very consensus and uh, consolidate that uh, from inside the US and Western country in European, so we can make alliance a normal standard to that is uh, to ask China uh, respect and do with us in economy and business. Very important. If we don't do directly do very very uh, frank with China, uh, we cannot go boom. That is the uh, we cannot um, sorry uh, uh, the, 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 agree with China situation now. So we can. Grow. If we don't do that, very dangerous because we um, total totalitarian system of regime. They centralize every uh, power and uh, resource. Difficult for we compete. How we can compete? So that means I think that your your question is very important, and I like as a question. So I think nice. We respect China and. Uh, Support for China growth and rise, but China respect us and for equality in business market now. So uh, global policy with integrity, right? Like I think that it's such an important player. And and like Jason started out saying that you know at fundamental people who work in government, people making these policies, at the core of them are good people. They just may not have the tools to then um, sort of put these policies in place or the support. Um, in the way that probably are more like just the general um, uh, human being, right? As uh, we are good people at the core. And if we can then uh, sort of put that out into our policies and how we help each other, not only domestically, but across the globe. Um, yeah, I hope, you know, Jason, for your kids and our kids, that it, it it's a better future with less uh, <coughs> less. Uh, politics, more integrity. Um, moving on a little bit, and I, I would could talk to you guys all for a really long time, but sort of one of the questions was, um, what, what are your views on what is the American way? And is there really any more an American way or a European way? Um, so let me put that to you, David. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I was actually born and raised in Stockholm, Sweden. My mom and dad still still lives in Stockholm, Sweden. So growing up, the U.S. was you know Dallas TV show. That was my representation <laughs> of the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> and you know you, you we were glued to the TV you know every week to watch that show. Yes. And McDonald's opening up in the city was a big deal. Uh, so you know it was the golden country for me to accomplish coming into come to, and I did. You know undergrad grad school in D.C. and made my fortune in New York. And uh, I think, you know, you know my, my, my immigration you know, story is what lends me to the question I want to ask Jason. You know, what are some of the uh, discussions your, your group is having on immigration, especially for, you know, the issues we've had in, in Silicon Valley? We don't want to train the brains and then not allow them to stay in the country because they don't have the right visa. And we want to keep the people we train in this country. And it was built on immigration. But I'm focusing more on, you know, immigration of people going to grad school in the U.S. 
and needing to stay in the U.S. Maybe you could shed some light on what the policies might be over the next year with the new administration. Well, I'm happy to try to do that uh, quickly because I think a few other folks need to engage before we sign off. Um, immigration is the issue that is probably most significant to our near-term economy and also kind of to the fabric of the nation. I think, Vandana, kind of referring to your sense, right, that if there's one ideal about America, it's yes. the idea that you don't have to be born here to be an American. And that is something that I think has become kind of weaponized over the last few years. There's two parts of the immigration debate. There's really the legal immigration debate and the undocumented or you know, illegal immigration debate. I think our country is poised right now to address the legal immigration debate, which is very much, I think, what you're talking about in terms of access to work. Right? The best way to address illegal immigration is to fix legal immigration so that we have the capacity, so that we don't have a kind of nation of hypocrisy where we're demanding these services but then pretending that we don't need the people to perform them. So I think that there's potential movement there around legal immigration. The other issue is what Europe has experienced. We have a you know, refugee problem in the United States, which we've never talked about before. And I think we are now seeing, and the Biden administration is going to struggle with the reality that we are now having a border crisis in a way that we literally haven't had for many years. And so I think you're going to see the asylum issues and the legal immigration issues dominate the debate. I do not think we're going to be talking about citizenship for 12 million undocumented workers for the next few years. Uh, yeah, I do. And, and I'll, come, I'll come to you in a minute, Tuan. But um, John, again, I'm going to ask you, and, and quite, I, I made sure I asked probably the few people who are not born in the U.S., for you, what is the American way? You know, you spent many, many years here, uh, but are not American by birth. What do you see it uh, in terms of with respect to policy? Um, well, I mean, obviously, we um, we are largely a nation of immigrants. I remember talking to um, Alan Patrickoff, a well-known venture capitalist, and he said he only invested in immigrants because they've already made that that step. Um, they've taken that big risk of moving and starting completely again in a new country. Um, and um, I think we ha we have to build that, but as David alluded to, we don't have a very good policy at the moment. We um, we bring people in, we we train them, we educate them, and then we kick them out. Um, we 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 need to um, nurture these people that we we educate with what has been a very good educational system, and and send them to stay here. And I think a lot of it comes down to putting incentives in the right place. And of course, you know, part of that is is the knowledge they bring with them, particularly um, researchers. And um, some countries now are openly shopping um, to 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 basically take not just our ideas, our innovation, but the people who generate them as well. Yeah. Um, Tuan, I think you wanted to add something, and then uh, we will close no, that. I, thank you. I don't ask. I only have ideas because I'm not American, but I like and respect American. So I would like to contribute American way. This is the we have fundamental, fundamental and infrastructure, law, Lego, and everything already constitution very good already. But I think now the U.S. American way is uh, help and save the world. That is the that slogan we do for. United Nations 2045 initiative that remaking the world, the second age of enlightenment. That American responsibility is that now we remaking the world to make the world better. And we have very glory responsibility for the world today. That is my idea. Great. Well, thank you. We have a really short time. I think for me, the takeaways from this is that you know, I think in terms of what each of you have said, but also where you see hopefully the future and where each of you would have an impact in a certain way, um, uh, the underlying ethos of it is that we have to um, equalize the playing field, equalize it from an economics perspective, equalize it from a, a state perspective, um, and then equalize it really from what we see as innovation and for the haves and haves not. And I, and I use that in the broadest of sense from, from education to access to, um, to uh, innovation. But also, I think innovation for me in particular, and having spent you know, a few years around sort of impact companies that are trying to change the world, is one of the key areas of equalizing the playing field because 
you, it doesn't mean you need to have a Harvard degree to come up with the next best idea, right? It doesn't mean that you have to have had um, a very privileged upbringing to, to come up with the next best idea. So um, I have a lot of hope um, for not only for America, but as a world. And I say that as I transitioning out and heading back to Europe. But um, it is such an important economy and um, it's great that there's got people like you at the realm of it. So thank you all very, very much for this. Um, and I look forward to staying in touch with each of you. Thank 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 you.